Good morning and welcome to San Diego People. I'm Alan Detton. San Diego is a great place to live and work, but how can we make it even better? The San Diego Foundation held a campaign to answer that question. The Our Greater San Diego Vision campaign asked San Diegans what they think is most important to our region. Today on San Diego People, we take a look at what thousands of San Diegans had to say. Plus, we'll also look at plans to make the vision a reality. With me now from the San Diego Foundation campaign is Bill Geppert and Lori holt Filer. Thank you both for being here today. Glad to be here. Thanks, Alan. Bill, let me start with you. How would you describe this campaign? What's it all about? Mm -hmm. Well, Alan, we started three years ago to really go out and engage the community. And it was really a discovery process to determine what San Diegans want, what they feel strongly about, their aspirations, their viewpoints, their fears, and their concerns mm -hmm. about the community. And really think long term about do we need a plan? and what should we invest in? Mm -hmm. Laura, you did an online survey and it involved thousands of people. Tell me a little about the survey you did. Well, we put it out on the internet and we said you need to participate, you need to tell us what you want for the next 50, uh, 50 years. And we had over 30,000 people uh, come online and we used an iPad army where they went up outside, talked to people at uh, senior centers, veterans homes, all kinds of places and went through the survey and asked the questions. Mm -hmm. What do you want to see? That was an amazing response too, wasn't it? It, it was, a, it's unprecedented. unprecedented. It's the high, it's yeah. the biggest in the country. Uh -huh. So. Bill, why did you decide there was a need for an initiative like this? What, what made you come up with this idea? Well, it was really a, the San Diego, San Diego Foundation is really committed to engaging the community and, and uh, really understanding what the community wants and needs. So this process was really a way of fully and thoroughly understanding in a very deep and, and thorough way and engaging some, you know, over 30,000 people in the process to really uh, represent what San Diegans want and bring that voice, their voice, to the community decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And that hopefully is, is what we plan to do in the future. And a lot of times uh, their voice isn't heard because uh, right. uh, until it's already a ballot measure of some form and then by that time people have made their minds up and it's over and done with. Yeah, people really do want to participate in the conversation and they do care. And a lot of the growth that we're going to have is um, from our children and our grandchildren. And so if San Diego is going to maintain a great quality of life, we need to prepare them for a place that will have that. And you know, one of the things we did is we did baseline data, uh, data and scientific study to determine how much are we going to grow. And San Diego is going to grow about 1.2 to 1.3 million people over the next 40 years. That's 40 percent growth. As Lori indicated, two-thirds of that growth, growth. Right, are our kids and our grandkids. So it sort of changed the discussion to say to people, okay, if we are going to grow, then what kind of housing do we need? What kind of jobs? Which was the number one priority and concern of people. Uh, we're going to need 400,000 more jobs, 500,000 more housing units. What kind of housing units are we going to build up? Are we going to build out? And really understand what was important. Education was very important. Also, what kinds of uh, open parks and open spaces in the environment, beaches and bays, are we going to have? Mm -hmm. And so taking those areas, uh, those were the most concern given the growth that we're going to experience. Jobs number one, years. obviously. Number one. Housing probably, what would you say second? Housing so. affordability was number two. Okay. So. And how about transportation? I know that's a huge factor in this area. If you're going to grow uh, by what, 40% you said over the right. next uh, how many years? 40 years. 40, 40 years. years. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, transportation has to be a huge factor in all it that. It is, and that's an economic issue, too, but it's how we're going to work, how we're going to live, and how we're going to move around, and how we're going to enjoy this place. So transportation mm -hmm. was clearly, a, mm -hmm. clearly an issue. And, right. and we mentioned, I think we were talking uh, uh, earlier before we got started on the program, uh, in, about the uh, high-speed rail. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised at the response on that. I think we were surprised Given as that well. was such a controversial <laughs> issue uh, after it was voted on in Sacramento by the state uh, legislature. That's right. Well, 70% of San Diego said that they thought that, that a connection, a high-speed rail or a high-speed connection uh, between San Diego and Los Angeles was really important to them. So mm -hmm. uh, the idea is we need to explore that. Uh, that isn't endorsing any plans that are out there. It's simply saying that it is an important transportation objective and goal for the community. So basically we're talking about four areas of concern, is that right, that, that you got from the population or the right. people you talked with? And mm -hmm. those areas, again, jobs, housing? Jobs, housing, uh, education, education, and then the 
the amenities that we enjoy, the cultural amenities that really draw people to this great community, the open space, the beaches, the bays, what kinds of parks are we going to have? Are we going to have a sports venue that, that uh, has a stadium as part of it? Are we going to have uh, you know, places to go and bike paths and, and ways to enjoy the community? Yeah. That's as very well important. as arts and culture. And, yeah. it, it, Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. Every phase of well, it. Well, you certainly can't leave out Balboa Park. I mean, right. that's, oh. that's, a, that's a plus for the community and always has been for years and years and years huge centerpiece to the community. Yeah. Uh, Lori, when you did this survey, how did you go about making sure that you didn't leave out a certain segment of the population, that you were including everyone? Well, that was one of the reasons why we use the iPad Army, because they purposely uh, went to senior centers so that they, because they may not connect with the computer mm -hmm. so we can help them. We also um, went to classrooms and students, and so about 20% of our, our survey was responded to by uh, people under the age of 18. Were, were they excited about it? I mean, this is something that, hey, I'm, they're still in high school, and they're thinking, that's a long way down the road. I've still got college, and, you know, I'm still at home. Why do I need to think about these things? Well, we had the opportunity to present the information to them and explain that uh, when you make a land use decision, is it going to be close to your job, or are you going to have to drive a long way to your job? What kind of job will you have, and where will that, um, how do you zone for that kind of a, a job? And they actually turned a few lights on and realized, oh, this the house just doesn't happen. Um, mm -hmm. They have to plan for that housing, and I get to decide what kind of house I want to live in, and they told us what they would like. So and it's really, it, I mean, this is a long-term plan, and mm -hmm. it's really that generation that's going to help see this plan Absolutely. through. You want to hear from them because it's their future. I right. mean, they are our future, so if we can engage them early in the process and get them thinking about their future then, yeah. and mm -hmm. have them as part of the process and their voice is represented, I think that's, that's potentially a game changer. Mm -hmm. yeah, do they want rural housing? Do they want to live out in the outskirts or would they like to live downtown and, and have all of the activity? Uh -huh. and, and when you looked at growth in the area, that kind of growth, I mean, obviously we're already tight on space. You talked about building up. But as far as building out, that that involves a lot of uh, of expansion from the standpoint of water, sewer, and all those things. I mean, that's that's a huge area to, uh, of concern. Mm -hmm. Well, 78 percent of San Diegans said that they didn't believe we had a regional plan today. So uh, when we embarked on this process uh, initially, we asked that question, and from that concern, really is is uh, gets right at you know we have to think about things like water, transportation, housing, what kinds of housing. I think one of the surprises was is that generally people uh, see a future in housing that is more vertical. It's more, you know, higher density. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, more exciting, you know, downtown uh, communities where there are restaurants and places to walk. And, and in open some ways parks. it's more cost effective too because you're absolutely. talking about uh, water again, expanding right. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. water lines, sewer lines, gas lines, mm -hmm. the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and that's very costly. And that's very that different. Whole, yeah, the whole survey presented that information too, so it was a learning experience as well. That if you build in a rural area and, and larger lots, it will cost you this much. It will cost all of us this much if you build in this way. And affordable housing was a number one issue, or one, one of the top yeah. issues. And if you asked that question 10 years ago, you'd have gotten a very different answer. Yeah. Well, I'm sure, no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. All right, Bill and Lori, thank you for being with us today. We thank you. We're going to continue our conversation on this topic in just a minute. Coming up on San Diego People, we'll talk more about how the San Diego Foundation and its affiliates give back to our community. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We're thinking about this or the Honda Odyssey next door. This one. But the Odyssey has the best resale value in its class, according to KBB.com. Eh, I wouldn't put too much value on cyber opinions. And the Odyssey Touring is the most fuel-efficient eight-passenger minivan. Eh, I wouldn't put too much value on things like that either. Eh, it's actual research. Eh, they'll give anybody a blog these days. Eh, we'll see you later. The Odyssey from Honda. Name most trusted brand in America by KBB.com. Only a Honda is a Honda. It's halftime during the Cox 10-day sale. Time to make a run to get half off any one of our great services for three months. Call today and get half off high-speed internet, half off digital phone, or half off advanced TV with NFL Red Zone with qualifying services. Want in on the action? You only have until September 30th to catch this great deal. Plus, there are even better deals when you bundle. This halftime, half-off sale will be gone in a hurry. Call today. 
Hi, I'm Dennis from the Men's Fashion Depot with a fantastic special. For a limited time, we're having a three for all, free for all. Buy any three suits at the Men's Fashion Depot and get three free dress shirts and three free silk ties. Plus, three free leather belts. For example, buy three $99.99 wool suits and get three free dress shirts, three free silk ties and three free leather belts all for only $279.99. The Men's Fashion Depot. Price, value, selection. Nobody even comes close. Nobody. You know, I'm the only one up here who, uh, who uh, opposes Proposition B, so-called pension reform. It's a fraud. And Bob Filner campaigned against pension reform as nearly two-thirds of San Diego approved it. Yet Bob Filner said... It's a fraud. Filner rallied against it and now says he'd be for pension reform. But remember... You know, I'm the only one up here who, uh, who uh, opposes Proposition B. Against pension reform, now for pension reform? San Diego just can't trust Bob Filner on pension reform. Welcome back to San Diego People. The San Diego Foundation works closely with community partners to make San Diego a better place to live. With me now to talk more about that is Jack Raymond, the former chair of the San Diego Foundation, Debbie Descar Espy with the Chula Vista Charitable Foundation, and Bethel Nation, a member of the San Diego Women's Foundation. Thank you all for being here today. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. What a great job, I think, in looking through this material that, that you all have done in putting this vision plan together. Jack, I understand several groups were involved, eight various charities throughout the county, charitable groups. Tell me about that and their role in all this. Alan, I'm always excited to talk about our local charitable foundations. Uh, because of the insi insight and the courage of the San Diego Foundation Board of Directors uh, with the leadership of Bob Kelly, they founded uh, what was a novel concept at the time and that is local charitable foundations for our local communities. Mm -hmm. uh, they realized that nobody knows a community better than those who live there. And so we have, as you indicated, established eight local charitable foundations from Chula Vista all the way to Oceanside. Mm -hmm. And they have been phenomenally successful and have raised the level of philanthropy throughout the region. Mm -hmm. Debbie, what's your group? How is it involved in this now? Well, the Chula Vista Charitable Foundation, we are a proud affiliate of the San Diego Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, the beauty of our group is we all believe in doing good and giving is good. And one of the things that um, the vision of our group is to help inspire others to give as well and, and to help support our community. Mm -hmm. And Bethel, you're with the uh, San Diego Women's Foundation. Of course, this is countywide, right? So, Absolutely. So you really had uh, a uh, great opportunity to talk to a lot of people throughout the county. Absolutely. And we were actually the first that started and it was when Bob Kelly, president and CEO of San Diego Foundation, realized women's pattern of giving was different. To be honest, we like to touch and feel and know where our money is going. We want to be involved. We want to see the impact. So it was created in 2000 with us and created a model. How is this actually going to work? Figured out what the granting was going to look like, how we were going to do it. And then the affiliates have built on our model and we we're proud to be the first ones to do it. For us, in 12 years, we have granted over $2.3 million into the San Diego region, region wide, to be able to impact real people, real programs, through 63 different nonprofit organizations. Community partners is how we refer to it, as you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Jack, who decides how the funds are, are spent uh, when it comes to implementing the vision plan? the members themselves and you know Bethel really brings up a good point is all of the local charitable foundations were modeled exactly after the Women's Foundation they have been phenomenally successful and so all of the members get involved in the granting process which is also a very interesting concept because before uh, the grant process was introduced most of us just gave money away sure. if you will well granting money is substantially different you go through a vetting process, you go through review, you go through examination, you go through follow-up. So it's a much more effective way uh, for money to be given through the philanthropic process. Well, you know how it's going to be used. I mean, you've seen the numbers, right, Debbie, right. in the stats, you know where it's going. 
And, and that's one of the beauty of this organization. We are able to watch where that money is going. We have a say in where the money is going. And with the Chula Vista Foundation or Charitable Foundation, what we have um, found is in that short period of time that we had formed, we were able to grant out $47,000 to our community and to what our community have found was needed best at mm -hmm. that time. Bethel, with a plan like this that, that I've got in front of me, we can get a shot of that, the, the vision plan. Will it make it easier for your organization to raise money? Let me go with this camera right here. Because everything is laid out. I mean, you see the numbers, you see the stats, you, you know exactly what people are thinking, what they want. Absolutely, and, and we definitely hope so. I think it has helped the community understand that a lot is needed and that we can't rely on government. We can't rely on large organizations anymore to do it. It really is the average person who steps up and say, I want to be part of my community and going forward and how can I make a difference. We are all member driven organizations and our money is granted from our members. It's not an individual wealthy person who says, let me give a lot of money. It's all of us coming together, pooling what we have and realizing, honestly, my $2,000 to any organization would it be helpful? Absolutely, but I have no idea what it's doing. Put my $2,000 with the other 200 members that are in the Sandy Women's Foundation with me, that's a real impact and that's making real change right away. Some of it immediately and then some of it going towards the future needs as well. Sure. Jack, how difficult is it to raise money with the economy like it is today? Well, it's difficult, but you can see the enthusiasm right here at this desk and it's contagious. Uh, and by doing it on a local level, on a person-to-person -person level, uh, it makes it easier, but it is difficult. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. And what did you learn, Debbie, from the survey that may have surprised you or may have, you may have thought, well, I didn't realize people wanted this in the community or they wanted that? Anything in particular? Um, actually, I'm, I don't think I, most things in the survey yeah. I was following are the already. that most yes. people want and, and the housing and the jobs and, and the infrastructure, those are the things that are, are vital to any community. E exactly. Infrastructure is important. Yeah. Um, watching the economy, you know, um, I, yeah. for myself, wasn't as surprised. I am in the... I am in the water field and I find mm -hmm. that I follow these issues very closely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Jack, let me ask you too, uh, where do you go from here now? What's the next step when it comes to putting all this together and, and, and helping implement the plan? Well, fortunately, we have uh, the Malin Burnham Center for Civic Engagement. Uh, we have uh, an excellent new head of that uh, mm -hmm. institution, which you'll be talking to, mm -hmm. and uh, it's up to that process to start slowly but surely developing ways to implement what the people have indicated they want. Mm -hmm. And we said we had eight groups, right, that, that were involved in all this. So again, it's going to, with this information, make it easier, you think, to raise funds than it is just going out there and saying, hey, we need money for our organization. Now you've got something to back it up. Absolutely. It, and luckily, it's never been we need money for our organization. It's always been we need money for what the community is telling us they need right now. It hasn't been our members sitting in a circle and say, where should money go ever, because that doesn't make the impact in the community. It all along has been research and talking to the community and saying, if we have our organization grants about $200,000 a year, where can that actually really make a difference right now this very next year? And so it's always been asking for specific needs and that makes a huge difference because people know right away what it can actually do and the lives it can make. There's things that are breadth, there's things that are depth. Some of the money changes lives individually. Some of it makes a difference in larger communities and might make a smaller difference, but all of it actually does make a difference across the region. Yeah, yeah. So Jack, when you read the uh, information from the vision plan, what was your take? Um, my take was it was a job extremely well done uh, under the leadership of Bill Geppert. It was really uh, transformational, nothing it, precedent setting. I don't think it's ever been done at, at this level before in the United States. And uh, so San Diego is fortunate uh, to have that base data and it gives all of us now something uh, with which we can uh, work together to implement. Mm -hmm. Good deal. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We're going to continue our discussion on this topic still ahead on San Diego People. 
We'll meet with the new executive director of the Malin Burnham Center for Civic Engagement. Plus details on plans to put San Diego's vision into action. Stay with us for that. There's a mossy Nissan for everyone's life. Like Alana Diaz, she's all about sugar and spice and everything nice. Like this 2013 Altima. It's newly redesigned and loaded with nice, hot features. And at Mossy Nissan, it's also got a rock bottom price up front. Right now at Mossy Nissan, get an Altima 2.5S with 38 MPG Highway for only $99 a month lease. Because at Mossy Nissan, you always drive better for less. The answer is up there, in the patterns. Our best guess is it hasn't gotten very far. Oh, we rattle a few. Morning. Five minutes. Homeland Marathon. On demand. We put Showtime on your time. Sorry. Passionate about Homeland? We invent better ways to love it even more. Time Warner Cable. Enjoy better. Scott Peters voted to increase public employee pension benefits, but not to pay for them. To hide the deficit, Peters approved fraudulent bond disclosures that triggered an investigation. He needed expensive lawyers to defend him. $600,000 worth. Who paid for them? You did. Scott Peters helped cause the pension scandal, then stuck you with the bill. The National Republican Congressional Committee is responsible for the content of this advertising. Have you been searching all over for an RV? Well, your search is over because La Mesa RV has the right RV at the right price right now. We put our huge buying power of nine dealerships in four states to work for you in making factory special purchases and in finding only the best pre-owned RVs. Like this used Fleetwood Southway and discounted 25000 or this new Thor Chateau discounted over 30000 It's just three sixteen dollars per month. We have the right RV at the right price right now. That's La Mesa RV, Highway 52 to Convoy Street in Kearney Mesa. And welcome back. This morning on San Diego People, San Diegans have spoken about what they would like to see for the future of our community. So how do you implement the changes to improve our region? With me now is Bong Wan Kim, the new vice president and executive director for the Malin San Burnham Center for Civic Engagement, along with Chris Michelle and Keith Jones from the Downtown San Diego Partnership. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Uh, let me call you BH and make it easier. How's that? That's right fine. out of the gate. Yeah. You're the new person on the block here, I understand, mm -hmm. coming from Los Angeles, and you've got this big vision plan that's been introduced now in the survey. How do you go about implementing that? Well, you know, I think the San Diego Foundation selected me for this awesome position because largely my experience is in Los Angeles. I've lived there for 25 years, and I've experienced the worst mm -hmm. and the best of what a large urban center uh, can do and the failure of leadership. Many people might remember 1992, the worst urban civil disaster, right. man-made, man uh, in the history of this country. I lived through that experience, and I uh, worked through a lot of racialized conflict during that time. Fast forward, the city charter gets amended, largely in reaction to what happened in 1992, and part, part of what that charter amendment resulted in was term limits for the mayor, term limits for the police chief, and a neighborhood council system. The mayor hired me, Mayor Antonio Viragosa hired me to oversee a citywide system of neighborhood councils. So Los Angeles is now governed by a grassroots system of civic engagement of 95 neighborhood councils covering the entire city, represented by 1,800 independently elected board members. So you know what it's like firsthand to pull people together under one group, one, one umbrella, so to speak. Right, and over those 25 years, I can say that I've seen Los Angeles really learn that in order to govern effectively, you need an active, engaged citizenry. And neighborhood councils are doing that in city government. And in 10 years, I think Los Angeles will be a different city as a result. Mm -hmm. That is what excited me about this project in San Diego. The leadership of the San Diego Foundation has gone through an unprecedented visioning process involving so many people. I get to come in and build something from the ground up that I think will be a national model but it's going to be important for us to make sure that we are 
walking the talk in terms of involving everybody, including the grass tops, I call the grass tops mm -hmm. at the neighborhood level, along with mayors and city council people and leaders of the private sector. And if we can get that kind of robust civic engagement, this region is going to not only address the challenges going forward, but do, do, do so in a way that's going to maintain and improve the quality of life for the region. Chris, let me ask you, why the survey? Was, it, was, this, was this an idea that other cities had done and you thought, well, maybe we should try it here, that we need to implement something like that as well? Well, many cities have done this. Um, Utah and Denver are two, uh, the state of Utah and the city of Denver. But, you know, what we realized is, is that the citizenry needed to have a voice in this process. So it was an inverted triangle. Instead of leaders opinion leaders, elected leaders telling the public, here's what we're going to do for you. This was the public's opportunity to say, this is what we want. We want to see this. And what some of the things they were telling us is, you know, look, we want to grow up, not out. We understand there are trade-offs and we're willing to make those trade-offs. We want good jobs. We want affordable housing. So the questions that they pose to us is, how can we get that? Yeah. And so that's what we've been working on. And it's important, too, when the public has a voice, Keith, I mean, you see the community take off. You see the community grow. And that's happened in so many other areas. It has. It has. We're in the middle of another uh, migration where people are coming from the suburbs back into communities such as downtown. It's just one neighborhood within our region uh, that we're seeing, as Chris says, people want to grow up, not out. And we want to see that the younger uh, demographic really wants to see the connection of the 24-7 live work play environment and everything from the parking garage up through the stores up through the apartments condos office buildings all working in harmonious together to create this perfect work live play balance and uh, this is what uh, we've come back with the survey uh, and the young de younger demographic really wants to be part of this and uh, the foundation and the downtown San Diego partnership is excited to play this critical role and to be part of this um, migration. BH, the, uh, the vision plan has some pretty hefty goals and it's not going to be accomplished overnight, is it? No, I think the uh, timeline that we're looking at is over the next 40, uh, 50 years because, you know, these problems weren't made in the short term and it's going to take a long time to address them. But I think the, with the leadership, uh, the vision that's been set in terms of the, the broad public participation that's going to be called for, that the downtown partnership is a great model for how you involve a broad sector of leaders to solve really tough problems. So I think you heard from a lot of the volunteer leadership in the earlier segments about the different elements of the plan, but these are all kind of basic things that people need for quality, to maintain a high quality of life mm -hmm. issues. And so we're gonna be sure that the South County the East County and other areas of the region that people don't usually hear from are going to be heard and we're going to make sure that the region is in that the regional vision is implemented in an inclusive and equitable way mm -hmm. you know there's so much to talk about on this uh, on this topic and we're just about out of time but I know we're going to have another program uh, in the near future and uh, bring you folks back and continue our discussion because as I said, the plan has so many statistics and so many numbers, and, and the umbrella that it calls for and what it calls for for the future is just fantastic. Well, we'd love to come back. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. And that's it for this morning's edition of San Diego People. Be sure and join us from KUSI News at 6 and 10 and 11. Have a great day.